Good afternoon, everyone. We are nearing the home stretch of day two of theCUBE's live coverage of HPE Discover here at the Venetian in Las Vegas. Say it ain't so. We don't want it to end. I know, it's, it's been a great show. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, and, you, 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 and I'm here next to Dave Vellante. So it is, it's been a great show, and this segment is Gonna be gonna be all you, Dave, because we are gonna be seriously <laughs> geeking out on I memory don't know about innovation. That. You use a lot of memory. Come yeah, on, everybody no, that's can relate. True. Yeah. You know, and and I'm I'm losing my memory a little. So <laughs> there, there you go. So anyway, I'd like to introduce our next guest. We have Alan Walker, Senior Director of Sales at Samsung. Thank you so much for Thanks coming for on the show. Mm -hmm. And RC Hubanis, Director of Business Enabling Engineering at Samsung. Thank yep. you so much for Thank coming you. on the show. Thank you for having us. So as I said, we're we're talking about memory innovations. Alan, why don't you give our viewers a lay of the land in terms of how current technologies are being integrated into AI infrastructure. So thank you for the question. So when we're talking about AI integration, we're really talking about trying to solve what we call the memory wall. And so the memory wall is when the CPU and GPU capability exceed the performance of the available memory, right? So that's primarily around memory capacity and memory bandwidth. And so when we think about the traditional memory pyramid, right, with the cache memory at the top, right, and then your system memory storage underneath, that pyramid is now growing several layers and right. becoming a bit much larger pyramid. At the top, we have high bandwidth memory, HBM. Uh, the purpose of HBM is to sit right next to the GPU. Um, give that availability of more memory right next to where the GPU can need it and can utilize it. Under the memory itself, we're now adding additional capabilities, what we call things like multi-rank DIMMs, CXL technology that add to the available bandwidth and memory capacity. And then even under that, you now have multiple different types of SSDs. You've got dual port NVMEs, you've got TLC based NVMEs, you've got QLC based NVMEs. Um, and so all of that is to help us solve what we're calling the, the memory wall. So you guys got this wrapped down, this is great. So, <laughs> you, we, so we've always used the concept of a pyramid. Right. Of course it used to be, you know, maybe, maybe some SSD, some big giant mainframe box, some spinning disk and tape. Right, right. Uh, remember, right. right? Yes, yes. <laughs> and I guess some of that's still there. Still there. Um, but then the 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 advent of low cost NAND, uh, the all flash data center, uh, consumer devices, mm -hmm. volumes through the roof, really changed everything. Mm -hmm. So it changed that that's, that pyramid. So you just described it very well. High bandwidth memory has essentially replaced that the cache layer, mm -hmm. right? And then all kinds of tricks with DIMMs and so forth to make it more cost effective. Then you got, you actually layering the SSDs now. Is the bottleneck like destaging those various um, layers so that you can, you can be more cost effective because there's only so much capacity? Is that sort of architecturally the, the challenge? Yeah, what we're trying to get to is putting the data as close as possible to where it can be used most efficiently, right? So again, that other power, that problem we're trying to solve on the memory wall is also the power consumption aspect of it. Power comes from moving data around. So if you can put more data closest to where it can be used, lower power consumption. Okay, and what's the, yeah. what, so talk to us about what's, what's going on in the customer base, what are the conversations that you're having over the, and how are they different from the ones that we were having five years ago? So, I, one thing that AI, AI has definitely generated is the need for higher capacity of DIMMs. So certainly our conversations have been around, you know, when are you going to be providing the 128 gigabyte DIMMs, the 256 gigabyte DIMMs, and increasing the amount of capacity that these large language models need right, in order to operate correctly. Um, we've also, uh, the bandwidth issue has, has also been a conversation, right, so what, what can the memory industry do to increase its bandwidth, its throughput, in order to supply all this extra data to the CPUs and the GPUs at a faster rate? And, and I know that's the hot topic, and I want to come back to yeah. HBM. But I want to back up a little bit, I was talking about the all flash data center, so, mm -hmm way early on last decade, you could see that 
NAND prices were going to cross over, um, let's call it, I hate that we use the term, high performance spinning disc. <laughs> right, like, right. It's such an <clears throat> oxymoron. Right. <laughs> but you know what I mean, high spin speed disc. That's, that's, that was the state of mm -hmm. high performance. It was right. mecha mechanical right. spinning yes. disc, spin it faster. Right. Uh, so there's less latency, okay, uh, that's fine. Or <laughs> maybe short stroke the heads, <laughs> right? All these right. ridiculous right. mechanical things that yes. you had to do. So the, the crossover basically killed that business. And then right. we, had, we thought that that was going to continue. Mm -hmm. And it kind of has, but kind of hasn't. The, the fluctuation in supply and demand right. has been such that it really hasn't fully, if I understand it, crossed over and put the final nail in the spinning disc coffin. I mean, you still see Seagate you know, doing pretty well. Um, but where are we in that? Is it, are we, yeah. do we have, I mean, we don't use spinning disc anymore in our laptops. I mean, that would be absurd, right? right. Can you imagine? Exactly. Oh, you five minutes, I'm going to go get a cup of coffee and wait for this thing to boot up. But why hasn't that happened in the data center and do we, is there light at the end of that tunnel? So uh, there's definitely light at the end of the tunnel. Um, from an acquisition cost, we're not there yet. Mm -hmm. But from a TCO, total cost of ownership, we're clearly there. Right, so on a QLC drive, we're now able to produce up to 128 terabytes on a single drive. Right. At a much higher performance than uh, any kind of spinning media with a much better reliability performance. And, uh, all, and again, going back to that power consumption, significantly reduced power consumption. Mm. So the TCO absolutely is there. The supply chain is the other aspect of it. The industry continues to go through cycles of increased demand, which AI is now driving. Uh, we are estimating about a 70% increase in NAND consumption year on year. Is that a capacity? To 25. A capacity? Yes, yeah. NAND bits shipped, if you want to put it that way. Okay. Right. So with, with these advancements in AI, but as you're, as you're saying, also this is immense demand. Absolutely. What are some of the developments that you see the, that are in store for the future? So that's where that kind of QLC type drive comes in. That's our ability to get to that next highest capacity point. So with TLC, we're really looking at about a 30 terabyte capacity point today. QLC, as I say, within the next 12 months will allow us to get to that 128 terabyte on a single drive, and then that will, con again, continuing down that path of more bandwidth, more capacity, climbing that memory wall. And the, right. the, the, the TCO discussion is interesting because we had forecast, this is David Floyer's work years ago, that the, you didn't have to have a crossover in order to have, in cost, a price, I should say, in order to have the crossover in demand. And it, it sort of proved true. And the reasoning, if I can recall, was you could, you could apply compression, you know, data reduction techniques. Mm. You really couldn't as much with spinning disk, unless you were doing like data domain things, you know. Um, and, and then you could share that data mm -hmm. much more effectively. Mm -hmm. um, and you could do probably a number of, oh, you could probably reduce your Oracle licenses. You know, <laughs> exactly. that was another big TCO <laughs> saying. But it yeah. seemed like people still looked at the acquisition cost and said, ah, you know, for this use case, and I'm sure the hyperscalers still using spinning mm -hmm. disk, right? You can't get your, your, your photos back from Facebook <laughs> in under three days now. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, right? Absolutely. It used to be instantaneous. Yes, yes, now yes. it's like, oh, they're I'm, sticking it on somewhere. Probably that's what you call latency. Right, right. Okay, so now let's fast forward to high bandwidth memory. It is the hot topic. Right. Yep. Explain to the audience why high bandwidth memory is such an enabler um, for AI, mm -hmm. and why we can't get more. <laughs> yes, yes. So, high band, the, the difference between high band with memory and your DDR, your regular system RAM, is it, it is, the high bandwidth is, it's over a thousand bits of data wide versus 64 for your normal system memory that you plug in, right? So, that gives you the bandwidth. In addition, um, HBM 3E is the next version that's going to be coming out. Uh, it has the capability of running over 1.2 terabytes per second of speed. So 
you stick that right next to the GPU or in the CPU, and you have a tremendous amount of throughput and bandwidth that it can utilize um, for these large language models. And that really has been the key to enabling the compute growth that you're seeing and you know the chat GPTs and stuff being able to even process those language models uh, by having HBM there to be able to feed that GPU with the data that it yep. needs. And it feels like there's, uh, just going out, let's, let's say five years. Five years is a reasonable time frame, yep. usually to forecast. These days, who knows? <laughs> but, but it feels like there's, there's, there's going to be like exceedingly high demand in the yeah. near to midterm, yes, um, based on customer conversations. Now I know that changes, and you know, silicon has always been a cyclical business, right? Yeah. Uh, but it feels like right now there's this big, big, you know, appetite for this type of memory right. because everybody's sort of leapfrogging, and you've got all the capex build out that That's the hyperscalers the... Are, are are putting forth, and it's different than the dot com, which was all companies that eventually went out of business taking on too, debt, too much debt, Enron and <laughs> right. Global Crossing. Absolutely. Right? And it was, they yep. were dying, on the, whereas today you got these, these you know, trillion, do, trillion dollars in, 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 in cash on the balance sheet. Yep. Correct. Okay, so it feels like this might have a little bit yeah, more, more leg room. What, what's your visibility? There's definitely yeah. longevity there, right? We have that forecast visibility at least through 2025, maybe even, you could even say into 2026 at this point, mm -hmm. right? I think collectively as an industry, we've essentially said, hey, looking at 2025 today, we're basically sold out already yeah. on the current planned um, HBM capacity. So it's going to take a while for the investments on our side to catch up with that sudden increase in demand. So what I would add is, you know, one of the challenges <clears throat> is HBM is, is difficult to make, right? Because it's, it's stacking a bunch of layers of silicon <clears throat> um, on top of one, one another and connecting them. Uh, that requires, that's challenging to do. So, <clears throat> excuse yeah, me. Yeah, we're in Vegas. Uh, sorry. Yeah, we're yeah, dry, yeah, yeah. 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 dry yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, we get it, because yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're out at night, we're at the, with the sphere last night. <laughs> yeah, this is great, yeah. that's a wedding day! Yeah, exactly. let me give you like a little, little follow-up! Uh, yeah. Yes, we're day, from, yeah. we're from Houston. Three. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay, we're so we're stacking. We're stacking, so we're, stacking, right. so we're, we're eight high, we're 12 high, and that, ta that takes some very special technology to do it. Yes. So, um, with this huge demand that has, all, is, has come upon us, the infrastructure, the additional machines were not there. So a big part of what the industry is doing is spending CapEx to increase the fabs, increase the capabilities to do that. So that's also why it's going to take a little bit of time for the industry to catch up and to be able to take care of the demand. Now you guys are not only design these, the, the silicon, the DRAM and the NAND and the HBM, you also make it. You got foundries, right? That, that also make it, so you actually know a little bit about, you know, yields and manufacturing. And right, when you talk to customers, do you do you position that as an advantage? I mean, some of your other competitors do it as well. Um, it does bring challenges, but mm -hmm. it, that vertical integration also gives you you benefit. You can control the process. Absolutely. Um, and so maybe you could discuss the strategic importance of foundry. So the yeah, I think from a strategic importance, it's important for us to be able to control the entire process, right? The design flow, the knowledge of the fab, the fab process, and how that translates into the end product. As, you know, as RC talked about, the stacking of the technology, you know, we're talking 12, 12 die stacks now on HBM, that's incredibly difficult to do and to replicate without having a knowledge of the underlying technology that the chip came into because now we're using what we call through silicon vias, TSV, right? So we're using copper pillars to connect all of those die up, right? Um, you know, we have one on the booth here uh, this week. It's a 12 high HBM 3E stack. The resultant chip, single chip, is less than a millimeter thick. So, okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so it's yeah. incredibly challenging. So, yes. right, where do you have to be <clears throat> With the, the, the hard thing about silicon is that you know you got whether it's Moore's law or you know 
whatever law you're using, increasing you know, transistor density mm -hmm. over time. Um, the subsequent generation is always a little bit more expensive at the beginning, right. and then you got to do sure. that crossover. Where do you have to be with yields, mm -hmm. you know, to, in order to get a, 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 a reasonable margin that you can actually sell this stuff and make a profit? So the yields have to be pretty significant, right? It, it's, it's, that's, but again, that's having that in-house knowledge. There can't be 50%. No. <laughs> right. I mean, well, well north, the, right? But the, 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 we need that in-house knowledge of how to develop the processes, where to optimize the technology to maximize that yields, right? And that goes back to the question of what is the advantage of having everything in-house? Yeah, so you've got to spend a tremendous amount of R&D, both in the design and in the manufacturing, in right. the manufacturing process. Right. Um, I was just going to ask, RC, you, before you got to Samsung, you spent 18 years at HPE, so it's a, it's a culture you're intimately familiar with, an agenda yes. you know well, a, a product offering you know well. What is it like to be back here, and, and what are you hearing that, that interests you? Oh, it's, I mean, it, it's wonderful to be back here, certainly. Um, and, you know, I, so I am an engineer, I am a geek at heart, so. <laughs> you know, that's every, not apparent. <laughs> yes, so everything that it. they are doing with AI, you know, from their Cray EX systems, Cray XD, even down to their, their mainstream compute stuff is incredible, and I, you know, I get an opportunity to work with those engineers, those architects, directly, and that, you know, that helps to satisfy the, the geek and, and the engineer in it, so. <laughs> so a high level, they want it to be lightning fast, durable, and dirt cheap. You know, so <laughs> that's exact. Pick two. <laughs> that's, yeah, right. right. <laughs> so, so, but when you think, thinking about architectures, system right. architectures, infrastructure architectures, what do you see as the big changes that are going to occur over the next two, three, five years? Um, <laughs> So really, it's it's going to continue to be a lot of more of the same, just kind of repeat and apply it to a different, you know, maybe to a different problem that we now have to solve. So you know, the the, the memory the memory wall is going to stay there. The compute capabilities for the GPUs, the CPUs, they're going to continue to increase. Mm -hmm. And on the memory side, we're always going to be challenged to continue to feed that beast, so to speak, and, and to keep it moving. So it really ends up being kind of a rinse and repeat. Um, you know, we, there's new technologies that we're working on. We've mentioned a few earlier, such as MRDIM. There's CXL memory technology. These are going to come into play to help ultimately also bring down that memory wall, at least for the moment and for the day, and then once those guys come out with the next generation of their chips, then the industry starts again and we start attempting to improve the infrastructure and address whatever other bottleneck might come to be. So, the, the spinning disk bottleneck, basically we can agree, is gone. Mm -hmm. right. And yeah. is it correct to think that it pushed the bottleneck sort of up the pyramid exactly. right, into your world yes. exactly. and across the network. Yes, yes, um, absolutely. And those yeah. are sort of the two big you know, computer science problems that yes. people are working on these right. days. Yeah, yes. I mean, so, so CXL, as, as RC mentioned, is the next ability to grow the memory independent of the CPU. Mm -hmm. um, so now you're creating racks of memory that can be pulled. Remember going back to the machine, yep. right? That concept yes. of, of pulled memory, right? Oh, wow. Now we're actually yeah. talking Photonics about- Photonics and- <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. Right, and so now you create those pools of memory, but you still have to be able to access them with reasonable latency to make it effective. Right, yeah. okay, uh, got it. So you'll be able to separate the, the memory from the CPU, scale them independently. Correct. Right. Uh, that gives you better uh, cost uh, efficacy. I'm sure there's some other software things that you can do and there's the key there. tricks. Um, there's probably some power implications. And yep. Um, wow, you guys got a lot going on. <laughs> it's a really challenging memory business. Wall, yeah. Yeah. It is. We're going to keep exactly. claiming that memory wall. Right. Yes. yes. Very good. Yes. A great note to end on. RC, Alan, thank you both so much for coming on theCUBE. Thank you very much pleasure. for having thank us. You. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. Rebecca Knight for Dave Vellante. Stay tuned for more of theCUBE's live coverage of HPE Discover. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in enterprise tech news and analysis.